Hey, what is up everyone? Welcome back to another review and today I'm taking a look at the high-grade juggernauts from the anime and manga 86. As usual, if you want one of these or any of these of your own, there is a link down there in the description and I got mine from Hobby Link Japan. Now here we go. So today we're going to be taking a look at two different versions of this particular kit that were both released on the first day. I'll mention that these are 148 scale, just in case you're into scale. I most certainly am. Definitely when it comes to small robots and stuff like this, I like to know what size they'd be in comparison to other ones. For example, out of the box these are about this size right here. And usually what I'd love to know is how big they'd be compared to a Gundam. We will be taking a look at that later on because I do have one 148th scale Gundam. But for now, let's take a quick look around this box. The other one we'll be taking a look at today is this one right here, which is the Shin use version. And the only thing that really makes this any different is the blades up front and the pilot figure inside of it. Otherwise, they are the same kit. And they both cost around $23 from Hobby Link Japan. So the side of the box gives us a bit of information of the weapons, the decals included in here, as well as the support unit we get. A little stand and a figure of Lena right here. I do have the kit of her as well in case you're wondering and that review will come up sometime in the future, just not today. Next up there's the side of the Shin Use box and as you can see it's basically the same besides it's got those high frequency blades instead of 12.7 millimeter heavy machine guns. Around then on the other side, we can see that there is another kit, a long range type coming out in future but hey, that's enough about the box. Let's see what we've got inside. So this is the pilot plastic we get in one of these kits. That's a tiny runner, then two C runners, two Bs, an A, and a D. So there is quite a little bit of building in one of these little guys, but not a whole lot. The build of these kits is simple and fun, and one cool aspect about the manual is each time you build a part, there's a little blurb beside it telling you about the particular part. For example, when you're building the main body, we've got a blurb about the engine. I'll read that stuff out when we're taking a look at the details on the kit, but for now, let's check out the actual kit itself as well as everything that it comes with. So once you get everything in the box built, this is what you get. In both boxes, it's pretty much the same. The only difference is the pilot figure that's knocking about inside of the juggernaut and the weapons up front. Besides that, everything else is the same and the decals are different too. So what we've got in here is the juggernaut with its main weapon up top and the sub weapons down bottom. We've got some alternate parts for using with those anchors up front, a shell that can be used with the cannon, a 148th scale Lena and an M101 Barrett Assemble. Lastly then we've got two stickers for using with the unit and these are for the Shin use version. The only other difference between these two kits is this right here. You get a little mini novel with the Shin use version. It is in Japanese and as far as I can see it's not in simple Japanese. Like they don't use any furigana except for on words that are pronounced in a weird way like that one right there. But besides that it's definitely relatively complex. And somehow I forgot to include it in here but we also have this little stand section for holding up the bot. Even though this has no problem at all holding itself up, this makes it easier to have it, well, just level to the ground. As for the decals that come with the other one, we get four for what I can see is four different characters from the manga and anime. And as for the differences between the Juggernaut, the Shin one has those blades up front, Shin in the cockpit. The general purpose one has machine guns up front and Kaie in the cockpit instead. So anyway, jumping right on into the aesthetics and there is the Shin use version out of the box put together with no extra effort besides one little thing. So the only thing I did change about this kit is I did color in that lens in the front main camera there with a red sharpie. That is all. You have two options in the kit, a clear one and one cast in solid red plastic. But I went with the clear one and just colored it in with a red sharpie. But besides that basic change, everything else is right out of box. No panel lining, no nothing. The these are very detailed little kits, so much so I could not help myself with the general use version that I just kind of had to well grubby it up like this. Basically I really was inspired by the picture on the box and on the manual of what it looked like just a little bit gritty, a little bit grimy. That seems to also go with the plot of 86 here as you can guess I have never read or seen it. And I was just inspired to make this mech as shit as the blurb made it out to be. So there it is looking like a walking clunking death trap. I will talk about how I did this later on it was extremely extremely simple but let's just take a look at the basic version and read a little bit about the different details on the kit. First up here we do have a fully opening cockpit with the pilot figure inside and that pilot is Shin. According to the manual, he is a processor for juggernauts who leads the spearhead squadron, the first defense squadron deployed to the first ward on the eastern front. He is known as the Undertaker, he is also being called the Reaper and nickname used by the 86 boys and girls who fought with him 
on the front line. His unique ability astonished Lena, his new handler. He is usually calm and enjoys reading. Probably why we got a book with this kit. So now moving through the different mechanisms of this kit, and first off we have the cockpit. The machines adopt clamshell type cockpits, but their defense capabilities are subpar and the processor will be fatally injured if they receive a direct hit. They do not offer direct views of the outside world and instead have three optical screens and a hollow window. The machines are controlled with two control sticks on the left and right. Next up is the engine and the engine is installed in the torso of the juggernauts. Compared to those used by the legion, they are made of inferior technology and have low output which is reflected in the inefficient mobility of the juggernauts. On the front then we've got the sensor. The main camera on the torso can be used to observe the battlefield and vibration sensors are equipped on the legs. A hollow window pops up when vibrations are detected and information of enemy units is transmitted to the processor. Armor. The juggernauts adopt aluminium alloy armor with a color scheme resembling old bones. They are thin to the point of being called aluminium caskets or aluminum depending on what you like and are even unable to withstand the heavy machine gun rounds fired by the legion scout type which penetrate the armor. So finally jumping into that full 360 degree spin so you can see absolutely every angle of one of these juggernauts so you can make your own decision on whether or not you like them. The detailing here is fantastic. The build is so much fun. I'm actually surprised by how much I like these kits. I thought they looked cool to begin with, but it's the build that it is so fun. They're quite solid for something so, well, small and delicate. They look great, and what can I say, I like them so much that I did detail one of them up. So this is small scale, so in a similar, well, I guess, to something like Warhammer. So I just used a couple of Warhammer techniques to make this look as rough and as crappy as the manuals say they are. So if you want to know how I got this effect right here, it was quite quick, maybe an hour's work or less after finishing the kit. First off, I panel lined it with one of these stand up. Nope, cannot. With one of these right here, which is a Gundam marker. This is a poor type panel liner. So I just use that to fill in the lines here and there, mainly just on the sides and the canopy up top. Next up then, I hit it with some top coat, which was Mr. Super Clear. The techniques from here on out probably would not work without this because usually you paint your kit before doing these sort of things because they're Warhammer stuff. So this kind of emulates the kit being painted. So next up then, I grabbed another Gundam marker. That is the silver metallic one in here. And what I did with that is I went around all the armor parts to make it look like the armor was chipped and you could see into the metal. I went around all the panel lines as well just to make every pan look scraped, beaten and like it's been through the worst of it. To bring out some of the details on the darker parts, the weaponry and the underside, I dry brushed some of this marker paint onto it. Now this I don't recommend because paint markers don't really have a whole lot of paint in them and dry brushing wastes paint really quickly. So I'd recommend getting some kind of pot of paint instead for dry brushing it on. But this was just to bring out the detail and kind of copy what I could see in the image on the front of the box and in the manual. Following this then, I give the whole kit a dose of this right here which is Citadel's Agrax Earthshade. You just dollop this on everywhere with a big old brush and it basically does the job for you. You could actually leave it at this point and it would still look pretty much like the manual. Dirty, messy, chipped and like it's been through the ringer. But I kind of wanted to go a little bit further because, well, I honestly get zero time to build Warhammer because of the channel here. So all I build is other kits. I wanted to try these for so, so long. This is Citadel's Typhus Corrosion, which is the general gunk in between everything on this kit. It's just some messy crap. Oh, there goes the leg. But everything on here that looks like sandy, big old dirty buildup, this is the Typhus Corrosion. It really gave this kit the feeling of it being dry dragged out of a forest swamp. It's such a cool technical paint. I adore it. My first time using it. And honestly, I wanted to get sidetracked completely and just start painting some Warhammer, but no, gotta get the reviews done. But anyway, next up then was the Citadel Rise of Rust. Now this is also a dry brush paint. So I dry brush this here and there over the Typhus Corrosion. These work so well together because the Typhus Corrosion gives a lot of raised segments that really give a good ground for the Rise of Rust to take to. So this really does give that realistic effect effect of, you know, the way when metal rust, it tends to get all kind of bubbly and crappy. It really does do that and it looks so good. Honestly, for something I just did basically on a whim, I'm really happy with the way this turned out and I kind of wish Warhammer models 
did come this easy to build and somewhat colored out of the box and it would make my life a whole lot easier. But either way, this turned out well. And it kind of goes to show how much I really do like these little kits. They're cool. Really cool. Anyway, on to the accessories. But first, I might be getting a little ahead of myself. I forgot that size comparison. So there it is side by side with a standard size high grade Gundam. There it is standing side by side with a master grade Gundam. And as for a Gundam that's in scale with it, well, there it is side by side with the mega size unicorn Gundam. So that's how big this would be compared to a Gundam. So here is a 148th scale juggernaut with absolutely everything that comes in the box and let's check it all out one by one. So both of these kits come with the same main armament up top which is the 57 millimeter smooth bore cannon. So that does mean both of these kits come with the exact same weapon up top but there is one coming out next month I think that does have a long range massive cannon. As for what this right here can do it can tilt at this point back here and raise up and down. We do have a little bit Bit of a piston in there that does move when you do move this so that is a cool little effect and as for what it says in the manual about this particular weapon it says that the smoothbore cannon is the standard equipment of juggernauts equipped on a gun mount arm it has a mechanism where the barrel swings up and down in conjunction with cylinder parts on the main unit enabling shots to be fired forward and above the barrel also slides when the weapon is fired so just like it said in the blurb right there, we do have a sliding gimmick in the cannon right here. So when you pull back on this, it slides back like it's firing and then it can move forward back into the home position like so. When it is in that home position, we do have this little section up on top of the cockpit, which this rests on. So that's pretty cool. The next thing mentioned in the manual is the smoothbore cannon casing ejecting mechanism. The weapon has a structure where the empty shell casings are forcibly discharged after they are fired from the back of the barrel where the magazine is connected. Connected. Next up then we've got the wire anchors. Two wire anchors, secondary armaments of the juggernauts are equipped on the front of the machines. They have sharp tips that can pierce building structures or enemy machines to pull them towards the user or to tow allied units that have been immobilized. So these wire anchors have multiple parts. We have the ones that are in here already which are the non-used versions so they're primed ready to fire and then we have these alternate parts which are a anchor on a wire as well as these little kind of spool sections for where the wire would have been attached. These are a little different from the ones that are already on here, which are a little more compact. These are extended. So in order to swap them out, you do have to remove the secondary weapon, take off the spool segment, then connect on the alternate version of the spool, like so, back on the weapon. The wire then attaches into this here hole, and there we go. The wire in here does make this poseable, but the wire is a little on the flimsy side. We are going to get what you want out of it, but can be a little bit awkward at times. But there you go, there's a bit of an example of those anchors being fired. So the next weapon in here and the one that separates these two kits is the high frequency blades. According to the manual, these are optional armaments that can be equipped on melee combat subarms. Although they are powerful weapons with blades that vibrate at high speeds, they have limited range, resulting in juggernauts needing to close in on legions to perform slashing attacks. They are difficult to handle and Shin is the only processor who uses them. So I will mention depending on the way you are trying to pose this it may get a little bit annoying for this little wire section back here can clash with the legs if they're raised up to the full well raise potential so they can clash a little bit depending on the kind of pose that you're trying to pull off so jumping across to the general purpose use version of this particular kit and this comes with 12.7 millimeter heavy machine guns and what it says is these are optional armaments that can be equipped on the melee combat sub arms members of the spearhead squadron excluding shin have equipped their juggernauts with two machine guns on the left and right sub arms they have an excellent rate of fire but lack power resulting in the weapons being mainly used for indirect fire and interception. So with this version of the Juggy, everything is pretty much the same except the weapons look different because they're machine guns. The arm still functions the same, it can move out the way just like so, as well as rotate down and up, and we do have the exact same anchors in behind that then. So as for the rest of the accessories, we got this funny little doodad that there plugs into the hole in the undercarriage just like so, so this can 
basically set the juggernaut on the ground without the use of its legs, which is handy for some poses if you want the legs reaching in certain directions, or you just want to set up a pose before actually pulling it off and just putting it down like that. It can stand up fine on its own most of the time, and uh, yeah, this is just kind of for giving it that little extra bit of support up on your shelf. Next up then, we've got that 148 scale Lena right here. I will mention everything you've seen in this review comes with both kits, so if you buy two of them, you do get two of her. And there's a quick 360 spin of this little figure. This is quite detailed. This is pretty cool. It is made of two parts. The main body and the outstretched arm are two different parts that need to be plugged in together. No glue required. It stands up fine, looks great. And honestly, once again, it's quite detailed for something so small. So the next thing we have in here is a little support unit. This is pretty cool because it is quite large. Of course, not as detailed as the actual juggernaut itself. And this is the Barrett Assemble. Given that a quick spin now for you, and at the same time, I'll give you the blurb out of the manual. It says, A combat support mecha that accompanies juggernauts to replenish ammunition and energy packs. They're also called scavengers due to their role of collecting debris and parts left on the battlefield. Autonomous support machine M101 Barrett, manufacturer Republic Arsenal, total length 3.1 meters, total height 2.5 meters, equipment, high performance crane arms by two, and large container mount. As for what this little guy can do, it can rotate at this point right here. The cranes are on ball joints, so they can move around, but as you can see, they are hollow on the inside. But again, it is nice to get something so large, even if it is a bit lacking in detail. Also, no container, but you may, or we may, see something similar to a container in future releases, just maybe. Lastly, then we've got some sticker style decals. So these are the shin use ones, so let's throw them on and see how they work. Okay, got the toothpick ready. Grabbing that decal, so apparently it goes in here, like so. There we go, number one. And flip around to the other side. Grabbing that decal, stick it on. And if you find it hard to apply these sort of things in this sort of way, that one is a little bit crooked, then you can always use a little bit of soapy water to move it around and then dry it off with a cotton bud or q-tip. Honestly though, these are fairly decent decals. You can't even really see the edge under very close scrutiny too much. You can definitely see it, but you can't see it that badly. So yeah, not so bad. I actually wish I'd thrown a decal onto this one before I give it the old worn outlook. Anyway, onto the articulation. So anyway, moving on to the articulation of this little guy, and so far I am quite impressed. We've already seen that this can move up like so, slide back and forward with its shooting action. The weapon's round front can swing up and forward like so. The cockpit can open up all the way like so. And as for the legs, each one of them is exactly the same. So we've rotation just inside the body there. It attaches down here via peg so you can bring it side to side like so. That can go all the way around but does get blocked by some aspects. It can then move at a joint right here which is a bit of a hinge. We've got a secondary peg here so we've got two points of rotation either side of that peg. This bend right here is just a kind of single hinge knee style joint so it can move all the way like that. So this can stand up extremely tall if you want to. And finally the ankle here gives us rotation at that point and some pivot in and out right here. So it is quite quite basic for a mecha, but the model kit does everything it needs to do and you can get some fairly decent little poses out of it and I assume you can pull off everything that you see in the show. So yeah, anyway, that right there is it for the review and these juggernauts are awesome. I had so much fun. You can actually tell by the fact that I painted one of them, well, detailed up and damaged one of them, that I really do like them. They're a whole lot of fun. They're a nice change from other model kits out there. I've never built anything quite like them. They're a unique mecha design, but with that awesome 2021 Bandai quality. When you see Bandai spirits on a box, you're pretty much guaranteed all of the time that you're gonna have a great time. So yeah, if you were thinking of picking these up and you love the manga and the anime, I say go for it. You will love them. And if you're just looking from other model kits to try something new, you will also love them. They're just so different. They're a lot of fun. They look cool. They're miniatures as opposed to scale models of giant robots. And by miniatures, I mean they kind of fall into the miniature scale that you can use stuff like Warhammer paints on and still get the same sort of battle damage and texture that is quite easy to pull off at that scale range and still look realistic. But yeah, what can I say? I recommend them. Try them out if you can. Anyway, as always, thank you so, so much for watching. If you want one of your own, there's links down there in the description and I'll see you next time.
So I cannot finish off this video right here without thanking you who's watching this video right now, as well as those who support me over on Patreon like Sean T, Caleb Engelhart, Brian Perez and Tyler Sanders, as well as channel members including Craig Jerry. As always, thank you for all of the support.